Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure this afternoon to welcome you and to introduce the person who's going to do the real introduction, uh, introduce Lynn Johnson. Lynn and her husband Bob, who's here with us, are founding friends of the Institute who've lived in the Princeton area for over 30 years. Lynn is an active volunteer serving on the boards of many institutions connected with the education and the arts. And uh, she is a present member of the um, Executive Committee of the Friends, and Bob is a former chair of the Friends of the Institute. But, and, but as I think many of you know, a great passion for more than 35 years has been art and the collecting of art. Amongst the works in their collection was Green Silk Forest, tapestry by Sheila Hicks, from whom we're going to hear today and hear about her work and this tapestry. We're enormously grateful to Lynn and Bob for donating Green Silk Forest to the Institute through their foundation, Educational Ventures. And the Johnstons have also provided funds for the restoration of the piece which was installed here last winter. So now over to Lynn. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And uh, mostly I'd like to thank Sheila. Sheila's the reason we're here today. And um, I should tell you the first time I ever met Sheila, my, my husband, who um, uh, is very interested in art books and um, seems to buy every art book that ever comes out. And he had an art book on um, fiber art. And he had seen some works by Sheila in there and uh, became very intrigued. And so he started this uh, communication correspondence with her. And, uh, but we had never met her. And um, in 1997, I was going to Paris with my daughter, who was in the senior at high school. And she and I went to visit uh, Sheila's atelier. Uh, over in the left bank in Paris. And of course, we fell in love, first of all, with Sheila, second of all, with her atelier, and then third, with her work. Um, not necessarily in that order, but that seemed to be uh, the order in which it kind of happened. And uh, as a result of that, uh, Bob and I um, bought a piece of hers, and which we have in our home, and then we bought another piece, which is on loan at Lawrenceville. And this is the third piece that we've been involved with. Um, so it's, it's a, a wonderful uh, friendship that we have all the years, um, and we just love her work and are so happy that it can be here at the Institute and all of you can enjoy it too. Um, many of you probably know a little bit about Sheila Sh in the uh, newsletter from the Institute. Uh, there was a nice write-up about her piece, but let me just remind you that she comes from Nebraska, <laughs> Hastings, Nebraska, and then she went to Yale where she had um, an uh, BFA and an MFA, and then she went to Chile on a Fulbright and spent time in Mexico, and I think really got into fiber art, um, really in some ways at the source of uh, where so much of the fiber art in, in our world history has come from. She has had shows um, all over the world, um, obviously from Chile to um, Tokyo to Korea, uh, she's had some wonderful things in, uh, in Asia, um, in Morocco, in Jerusalem, in Prague, and um, obviously then in Europe, Amsterdam, and Paris. And she's in the collections at the uh, Museum of Modern Art, uh, Metropolitan, the Philadelphia, on it goes. Um, she is really a, a grand dame of, of her trade and her art, and um, we're very delighted to hear Sheila to talk to us about um, you. Thank you. We'll turn the projector on and we'll turn the lights, perhaps the spotlights off because we'll get a better um, grip on the images that uh, will be projected. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Goddard. Thank you, Mr. Garrett. Mike. Thank you to Mr. and Mrs. Johnston. This is the first time I've seen the panels installed here. It's going to work. Everything is going to work here. Everything works here. <laughs> I've had so many sleepless nights between Paris and then coming to New York and thinking about this. 
and how will we manage this and how will we manage that? And I should just uh, relax because everything works here. And <clears throat> I'm going to show you a 28, 29 minute photo magico presentation of my work, which I've put together myself, so it's rather amateurish. But it's my way of looking at my work. I just showed you a small loom, which is the beginning and end of all my work. It's about the size of a page of paper or a plate on the table. And I use that small little frame with nails pounded into it to sketch and to work on, and then also to try and make finished works that will hold no bigger than, say, eight, 10 inches, that will hold your attention and your imagination and allow you to dream and scale upward into, let's say, middle size works and maybe larger works and then maybe monumental works. <clears throat> but everything begins for me at this size, about this size. And yet I have to admit that I went through labor-intensive education at the Yale School of Art under the tutelage of Joseph Albers, the Bauhaus master, where we studied color, form, texture, design. And when I graduated from Yale, as you mentioned, Lynn, he saw to it that I had a Fulbright scholarship to go to Chile because he picked up on my interest in textiles. I don't know if you see the little person, a little tiny little person down there. That was a stage curtain that I just showed you. And here's the manufacture of it. <clears throat> in Kiryu Guma, Japan. And it's with new kinds of materials made out of synthetics, polyester, that awful word, but other new kinds of fabrics where the colors are applied through a vacuum machine, dyed paper, impreg paper impregnated with dye, folded and applied to the textile in this machine will permeate the fabric and make it almost like a butterfly wing so that when you hang it vertically up in the air and then theater light it, as you can imagine, which is infinite amount of possibilities, the stage curtain will start to glitter and dance and flow as though someone has disturbed an immense butterfly nest. Remember in Guatemala how there are forests of butterflies that migrate? Well, this is the Japanese call a stage curtain like this that really serves also as a fire curtain and comes down vertically from above. They call it doncho. And when someone says, where did you get the idea for the doncho? I say, I hung nurses' blouses up about more than a thousand in a municipal cultural center in Montreuil, outside Paris. And I studied scale, and I studied theater. If I would sit in the front row, the middle, the balcony, or how far I would sit away from the stage and try and find a way to work with pliable surfaces, which can be lit, front lit, or back lit, these are babies' little blouses that are splayed open and re-sewn back together again, but lit from behind. <clears throat> and knowing that very, very large projects require elements that can be additive and infinite. So working with techniques that I can build, like a construction or engineer, um, 
bricks and repetitive elements accumulated into large either three-dimensional or two-dimensional walls. This is Embarcadero Center in San Francisco and it goes up three stories high on a concrete wall, very much like this concrete. But it comes from little studies like this. If the sun is bothering anyone, maybe you just move a little bit to the right or to the left. <laughs> I have sympathy for you because I, <laughs> I want you to enjoy the colors. Huh? This is my studio in Paris in the 300-year-old courtyard called the Cour de Rouen. See how much fun I'm having making the photo magico? Uh, it's a German pattern, by the way, this little program for your computers. And foolproof, or else I couldn't have done it. <laughs> <laughs> the, tech, the technical staff of Bard Graduate School in New York turn, turned me on to this and gave me a 10-minute tutorship and then left me off on my own to, to enjoy superimposing images, diffusing, zooming. But it's the way I look at things myself. So you're really looking a little bit through my uh, binoculars and through my... Uh, distracted way of approaching things. To me, these things relate to the courtyard here, to the birch trees, to the different uh, elements in nature, and to walking past them and walking through them. I don't see these things necessarily as a painting on the wall. The bas-relief in front of me and this image I think should be enjoyed by walking by them, passing in front of them, going, if you can, from left to right and then right to left, sitting on the floor, looking up at them, looking from above on a balcony, as I see some people are up on the balcony. It's great to be able to see things from different perspectives and different angles. These threads are linen, and I take cones of all different kinds of linen. I like to use linen. The moths don't attack linen. That's a big plus. Federal Courthouse in New York, if you've gone to trial, if you've been a witness or <laughs> jury member. <clears throat> the, two court court, the two courtrooms at Foley Square, uh, the principal judges there have these, and they're made of twisted skeins of linen. Anyway, drawing these different colors. The jury is sitting on the right over here. Judge Grise is sitting behind his bench. The details of walking into the forest again, but silk on very small scale of just a wrapping technique that's an ancient embroidery technique. There happens to be a round metal needle. Do you see it, a half circular needle? Therefore, the title of my lecture. That's the tool that my assistant is using in her right hand on the left side of the screen. And this, all of these panels and all of these things that I'm making are done off loom with only by hand sewing with this half circular needle. It's a technique that traditionally is called couching. Couching, fil couché, threads that lie on top. And the bayou tapestry is based on that, is using that same technique, the bayou tapestry of um, the Battle of Hastings in Normandy. So it's a very ancient technique. The last one we just saw was the Ford Foundation in New York, which was macro broderie, not macro like the fish, macro like large embroidery stitches. And these are also twisted skeins and in a close up you'll see how I can go back to my painting origins and sort of stroke the colors by mixing the threads. 
but I have an additive plus. That is, I can also use texture. All the different kinds of surfaces that color is absorbed into wool, cotton, linen, silk, or just plain texture and light. This is my greenhouse in Paris, where I sit and work. And all of these are hand-wrapped. Everything you're seeing is hand-done, by the way. <clears throat> so just quietly um, wrapping row after row of uh, thread and then taking the cords once they're wrapped, the long one, and interlacing them in a weaverly gesture, and then hanging them here, about eight panels within a room, and making an environment that you could walk through. That was at the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, the last one. Here is Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The last one, by the way, were little tiny corks that were um, inflammable, wrapped with gold thread, and then individually sewn onto the wall, like a moonscape. Ponytails, as they've come to be known. <laughs> I consider them just a textural wall surface. Um, wall surface, in other words, not hung on a wall, but the wall itself completely covered. So it becomes a pliable plane in a way that it is the entire wall. This is something different. These are military uniforms. And after doing uh, many installations of, in the category of decorative arts, that is working with architects and integrating things into architectural contexts, I cut back into the simple beauty of textile itself and the meaning of textile, military uniforms that I hung in um, Jerusalem in the Israel Museum and had them open the window. It's against museum principles, but we opened the window and brought them out as like a clothesline into the entrance and courtyard of the museum because in Israel, all of the clotheslines, when you drive around, you will see military uniforms hanging out, washed and dried washed and drying. And I thought it was the most profound way to speak about textile when you speak about the intimate contact we have with this material. Not only the decorative aspects, but the um, daily use and familiarity with it. Here, my courtyard again, where I'm taking the nurse's blouses and ripping them Sounds beautiful when you rip them. Huh? Deschire in French. And then put them in the washing machine and dye them. And then take them to the countryside and show them in a village and walk around the town and involve the people who live in the village with the experience of textile as a plasticienne, a sculpture, or as an element that is possible to use for contemplation or art making. Here, they kept it in a church in the village. We call this the menhir. Back to twisting skeins and really going for it in terms of color and subtlety for a project in Japan where textiles are their second uh, voice after ceramics, architecture, textiles. This is a piece of a tapestry I once showed in the Lausanne Biennale of tapestry and someone found it in the flea market in Paris, cut up in about six pieces. And she shipped it to California, and she asked me one day when I was giving a lecture at the Getty if I would come by 
she lived very near the Getty Museum, and I went to see it. And she said, is this really yours? The person who sold it to me in the flea market said, it might be. And I said, it is. It's part of one of my tapestries. Let me restore it for you. So it's in Los Angeles in her home now. Aubusson, the, the traditional weaving center of France. Often I'm told, especially by the French, that what I do is not tapestry, strictly speaking. The definition of tapestry. When you look it up, you'll see. I'm doing often more things related to pasmontry than tapestry. But here I had a job that permitted me to go to the center of tapestry in France, Aubusson, and weave very large bas lisse, huh, horizontal. There's the loom. Tapestries for the university in Riyadh, the new university, King Saud University. There, three, four weavers would sit side by side, and we wove sand for six months. A desert, a sort of pictorial rendition of a desert. Well, now, then there's the oasis. Then we did the palm tree. Um, and we kept going. And I did about 17 tapestries during the course of three years down in Aubusson to face off the French. Uh, I did it for many reasons, because I loved doing it. But it was to face off this idea that I didn't have in my vocabulary tapestry. Here, rug making, which is knotting. So it would be savonnerie, the other traditional technique of making savonnerie, hand knotting carpets. But I picked the carpets up off the floor and hung them on the wall. And then scissor, scissor cut by hand different reliefs. The pile would be knotted, and then I could cut back into the pile and make it almost like carving in wool. The last one was in Mexico. The Banco, the Banco, Banco de Mexico, Palacio Iturbide, was in a colonial building. Now, this is the Cathedral of Angers, where there's a very important, as you know, the, <laughs> the historical tapestries are in Angers, in the chateau in Angers. And I went there, and I see repeatedly this beautiful arched form wherever I go, whether it's in Morocco, whether it's in France, whether it's in Japan, and I continually use that arched form in my work, this kind of lifting, pardon, lifting up feeling and making the small ones in Mexico in the 1960s. I can trace them and I can see that it was already in my consciousness or unconsciousness that I was lifting threads upward. Here it is along a river with the students at the Kunst Academy in The Hague. Modest means go into space was the exercise. With modest means go into space. Then I take the idea and make in a Japanese Buddhist contemporary building a long streak in space that is incised and set into the granite wall, not hanging on the wall, but inside the wall. And seen at night, people walk by here and going into the temple. And it sort of glows at night like a red streak. Macro broderie, petit point, we say, petty point. But instead of petty point, little point, I'm doing grand point, big point. So jumping squares and making embroidery on canvas backing. This is Osaki Metro Station in Tokyo, going up three stories. They're very well behaved in Japan, of course, you know, they, in the metro station, very clean, no smoking, no touching. Here at The Hague, again, the rival of the Queen for the investiture of the fellows of the Kunst Academy. And 
they asked me if, with the students if I would make it a festive occasion. But we don't have any money. So can you do it on the creative side, but with very little material? And so the students and I went out into the local market and bought Chinese umbrellas of paper and voilage, uh, this kind of netting. And with that, we made a fantastic performance for the arrival of the queen and her guests. This is an old horse stables of a slate mine, the last working mine, the last functioning mine in France, in Trelazé. You see the slate in the walls where the paint has fallen? And I loved the atmosphere of this place. And the mayor turned it over to me for the summer, and I made an exhibition of small works and large works because the materials attracted me and the smell. It was a very nice feeling to walk in. And it was a very earthy smell. And then these materials of linen and and little jewel-like touches of color. These are all, of course, done on this little loom that I showed you in the first photograph. What could become large, larger, very large, <laughs> in it's up to an architect or someone like Frank Gehry to say, let's move out and break the space in a different way and see things in a different form. We don't even need to weave or embroider or wrap. Just thread on its own has a, has a certain beauty. And its suppleness makes it There's something strange going to happen here. <coughs> this is just embroidery on a canvas. But do you see what happens? Like a little step pattern starts to, that's a flat <coughs> woven, a flatly embroidered panel. Now I tip it up the panel. It's under electric light, so the photo's not too good. Um, and it becomes a bamboo forest for the Japanese at the penthouse sort of entrance of a of a building in Toronomon near the United States Embassy there. These panels are laid out ready to be rolled and shipped to Japan. And so I'm photographing them out of the third floor window of my courtyard, as are most of my neighbors looking out and photographing and saying goodbye to a project that took us two years to make. And here's our technique, a, t a detail of the twisting and the counter twisting, the S twist and the Z twist, as in the old Peruvian weavings. And here are the individual panels of 52 panels, two meters by two meters 60, that are then aligned on a wall, very much like this, invisibly, so you don't see the joints. And it runs. 103 meters, 330 feet. We were not trying to go into Guinness's Book of Records, but inadvertently we did it. <laughs> and built inside of a theater in Fuji City. You see the tapestry, the bas relief? And it is uh, very functional because it color codes the entrances into three different auditoriums in that building of that cultural center. I'll mention that Mount Fuji is through the glass windows on the other side when it's not obscured with clouds. And entrance of my studio, I'm taking my materials that I'm making, wrapping around cork again with heavy linen, and trying to assemble elements for a project in Minneapolis, Minnesota for the headquarters of Target Company, their, their main big salon building on their main floor. 
And if I draw one, two, three colors, red, blue, and do optical color mixtures as I wrap, the transitions are fascinating from day to day as you go along. And the others are tubes that are also a synthetic inflammable material. And there are ways of fitting them together, plugging them in one to the other. And so I ship them all in a container to Minneapolis and then plug them in one to the other and then wrap where the joints are so you don't see. And just keep going until we find in the place the right composition and the right amount, the right dose. But you see we've dropped all of the ones that look like snails, even though we spent a good long while making them, because we thought it was an overdose. Once we got into the space and started working, it was, pardon me, it was more powerful just to use the tubular ones than to start working with the snails and the ribbons moving in and out of them. So I had to modify my original design and concept actually on site during installation. That was very hard to do. It was two or three nights of sleepless deliberation with myself of how could I waste this much time preparing something and then not really going through with the accepted design. But I knew this was what was going to happen to that space. It was going to be used. And they were going to bring in their own elements, their own trees. You know, many people, more than a thousand people work there. Christmas time, the president addresses all the employees. And it just seemed we should become background music and allow them their space to use it as they wanted to. Not to take it over like a museum and do a whole presentation that was only my story. I had to complement their story and their use of the space. Whereas when I'm in my courtyard, I just play and make things <clears throat> in my own here. This will be especially for Lynn and Bob Johnston. It's the windows of Hermès in Paris, where Hermès came to my studio and collected all of these wrapped little soft, what I call soft stones, in which I place memories, like clothes I can't wear but can't bear to throw away. <laughs> and they put it in their windows, and with that, they use it as a decor, and they sell Hermes fine leather goods or whatever. But really, it's a secret. That probably is my and my children's bathing suits from a very important vacation that we once had in Morocco or somewhere. This you'll recognize because we've, we have them flayed open. You see the green silk now, the base, that are stretched. And we're sewing with a little semicircular needle the cords back on. We have lifted all of the cords off, all the base, renewed the base, hand-woven silk in Bangalore, India, and then reapplied all of the cords back on that new base and rewrapped whenever there was damage. And Bob Johnston will contest that there was damage, water damage, mice damage. He rescued these down in the cellar of AT&T in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. He's my hero. <laughs> and then helped nurse along the idea that we should restore and bring them back to life. And we sought help, who would be willing to do it. And finally, I thought I should just get at it and do it myself and go back to the original people. The woman on the left, Ava, my assistant for 40 years, um, came back in and directed her and keep her group. And we all worked on these and brought them back to life. And now we're getting ready to take them off the panels, strip them, roll them, send them in to Princeton, where they took over 
the installation in a brilliant and sensitive way. Because coming here today and seeing what they did, it was worth the tedious redoing of something. You know, it takes much longer to redo something than it does to just do it. Because you so many decisions involved. And you have to take it apart and then re-put it back together again. So these rewrites, think twice before you get involved in them. They don't necessarily always come out better the second time round than the first time. But I'm so gratified and happy to be here and see what you've done and the way you've placed them and the way you've made it work in your space. This is very touching to me. I'm willing to take any questions that you might have. I don't want to be too lengthy. I want you to enjoy the, I think we'll take the podium away and put the lights on and let you come up and with the new owner's permission, you might even be able to touch them <laughs> briefly <laughs> because they're tactile. The textiles, of course, are meant to be touched either with your eyes but or also respectfully with, uh, I think this is a very credible public that I can trust. It's not <laughs> because uh, in the museums, of course, they put big. <laughs> Okay. They have to um, protect things once they go into museums, so they put them in plexiglass boxes or cases or with um, something, you know, that they need to do. But I love uh, the fact that it, even if you can't touch it, if they say do not touch, I love the feeling that you could if you approached it, if you wanted to. Huh? Any questions today? The way I maintain, you know, maintenance, huh? Sure. What about maintenance of something like this? And what's the long, I'm gonna add to your question. You don't mind? What's the longevity and how do you maintain and take care of something like this? I start with the uh, ancient tapestries and say the ones that are maybe 300, 400 years old are still with us that have been fading, if they've been mistreated, you know, and put in uh, sunlight for long periods of time with the UV fading. But um, if you turn them over and look at the back of those tapestries, the ancient, you know, medieval tapestries, they're brilliant. The backs of chairs that you strip off of upholstery, you look on the back, they're brilliant. If you take care of them, they last hundreds of years. And I say to the client, how many hundred years do you want this to last. And then let's calculate backward from there. Let's use very good natural materials, no glue, no other foreign elements. Just let's go for thread with thread, wool with silk with linen, if it's acrylic or if it's polyester or if it's all of these other new materials, man-made, they may have um, intrinsic qualities that are appreciable, but they may not have the longevity that the natural materials have. And of course, the mixtures, all of the melange of uh, fibers and threads today, there were in mystery land, definitely. We don't know how long a lot of these are going to last and become brittle or crack or fray. How I mean, how I would treat this, I would take um, Dyson ham sweeper. I would put a pantyhose over the head and I would carefully vacuum it because with a little attachment that comes as a kind of a flat attachment, I would just go. Now, 
on the ponytails and on the other tapestries that you saw that are bas relief, I would take a uh, broom and maybe put another patty hose over it and I would whack the tapestry. And I'd let the dust free from the surface. And whatever is left over, I would vacuum, but I would keep it alive like this. There's no other special treatment. I wouldn't get into a scotch guard or any of these kind of protective uh, plastifications or um, techniques. Where we get into trouble is when the fire department wants to come in and use some of its chemicals, like at the Ford Foundation. The big tapestries at the Ford Foundation, the fire department took over after about three years and said these have to be fireproofed and they wanted to spray them. Well, when they sprayed the silk that's embroidered onto the linen, there was a little sort of crystalline halo that was left around the edge, sort of crystals. So I said, well, we've got to go back, vacuum off the crystals and see how the silk is going to hold up under this chemical. And some of the silk starts splitting around the edges. But they said, well, it's fireproof now. So, um, and they, not long ago, they had uh, this ceremony I went to with the architect and they, what do you call it when they landmark something in New York? The Ford Foundation building was landmarked and the tapestries too. So I think they'll just disintegrate with the building. <laughs> but I think we don't have to be too careful about these things. Huh? They're, uh, my, I try and make my work very husky. Yes? Did you have a question? Yes? Ah, very astute. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. The question is, what about the tubes? I think, for instance, in the Target project. Huh? Um, and how do I change my design to accommodate the technical difficulties? or the technical mechanism for producing it? Is that the question? <clears throat> Since I had to deal with weight, I, was, I knew I was going up on a very big wall, so weight had to be uh, a primary consideration. I knew the fire department would be right in there designing with me. Um, and I knew that uh, I had to be adaptable because I couldn't make, I have a small studio. And even my large courtyard, if I spread it out and pretended I was doing a mock-up, full mock-up, full-scale mock-up of that project, I would never have gotten the scale right because in my old stone courtyard and this modern building, it wouldn't work. So I knew there was too many surprise elements there where I was going to have to adjust the design. And I needed elements that would allow me to do that. What about the material and the disintegration of the interior material? So far, they tell me it's perfect. It's been there six years. It hasn't moved, it hasn't breathed, you know, with the air conditioning and with the change of climate. Uh, so far, I'm saying, are any of the threads loosening or the tension? Not that they can tell. I'm waiting for them to invite me to come over and take a look. They don't invite me. <laughs> they just say everything's fine. Don't, you know, don't fret. I, I'm known as a fretter. <laughs> but so far, so good. So what is the composition of that material? It's a material that plumbers. How do I find these materials? The cork I use, because take your cork from your bottles and put a flame to them and see what happens. They're acceptable in building codes, that kind of material. The material used in the tubes are used by plumbers in buildings for wrapping pipes and for encasing pipes. They have to pass the fire codes 
those materials. So if they're plumbing and passing the fire codes, I'm putting them inside and then wrapping them in coarse linen, which also passes the fire codes when it's given a dye bath with a chemical fire retardant. Is that a complete answer? I, I'm trying not to act like the political arena today where they're fed questions and they don't give answers. They give sort of, <laughs> <laughs> they give sort of some spiel about their giraffe who went to Africa or something. Um, <clears throat> yes. It was a very enlightened curator who invited me to do that. Um, artists have ideas, but they go nowhere until you find a curator who will help you get it out into space. A curator or a museum invitation of some kind or a cultural committee, a village, in that case had a, its own cultural committee. Um, they had seen me hang those nurses' blouses up in the municipal cultural center of Montreuil. By the time they got back to me, I had dyed them. They were no longer the white blouses because I'd taken them to Sweden and a few other places and made shows. And I got tired of, I don't like to repeat myself. It's no fun. So I made them into bougainvillea colors. Um, and they said, we have a small budget. You know, we're a village. We like to do a summer show. It brings people to our village and to our castle and to our region, and we can advertise it. We'd like something wonderful to put on a poster and to animate the village for the summer. And they said, we thought of you. Ah, I have just the right thing. <laughs> and so I pulled out of gunny sacks, my pink rags, and pulled them out and pulled them out. And more, do you have a lot of these? I said, I have a lot of it, a lot. Can we send our truck, the village truck, because they have for errands, like you have here, your truck, <laughs> which has been very helpful. Uh, can we send our truck up? Yes. We don't have any insurance problems? No. We don't have to build crates and have, you know, the budgets for all these shows go into insurance and crates and all this. Um, one, two, three, and away we go with the village truck and with all my sacks of rags, and now, well, what do you think you'll do with them? I don't know. Let's look around the village. The village is beautiful. Well, the people have never seen or dealt with something like this. I said, they won't be afraid because it's a friendly material, and it's not threatening, and it's not neurotic-based. <laughs> it's not going to make anyone nervous. It'll per be perplexing, perhaps, for a moment. But it's not going, the children are not going to run home crying of what they saw passing by. Um, and they gave me freedom to just, and they also took the prisoners out of the uh, local, the well-behaved prisoners in the local prison and gave them to me as helpmates. Because we needed people to, you know, we built them up on the ladder and in the ceiling and in the park. Volunteers in the prison came out and worked with me for two weeks in the village of every day going around and presenting things. I had to deal with smoking problems, though. You know, because they'd haul it, put it there, sit on it, relax. <laughs> so, and I'd say, come on, guys. We're going down the block now, and we're going to hang on the facade of the city hall. Oh, no, we're not going over there to city hall. That meant, you know, <laughs> come on, you're with me. We're going to city hall, and we're going to hang them all in front of the mayor's office. And when he comes out, you know, it'll be like gangbusters. <laughs> we had a wonderful time in this village. It was a social 
interaction. And this material lends itself to that. I think, the vocabulary of it. Of course, they kept it in the church. Now, that's another dimension. You know, it had a spiritual message that they left it standing. It was beautiful when it was just in the... Good. It's, uh, it, it was inevitable, I think. Um, painting at Yale and being exposed to Albers color classes and then going into New York and seeing all the abstract expressionist paintings, which was the period when I started. Um, you just couldn't help but uh, deal with mixing and interlocking and meshing colors and textures. So I mentioned yesterday or the day before, I had so many ideas flowing that I would paint one painting on top of another. Begin a painting, continue working on it, maybe you're a painter. Um, at the end of the month, maybe I had seven paintings on that painting and no way to recapture that painting again of where I began. And when I started working with textiles, all right, I don't mind. I know the story of Penelope who was weaving and unweaving and weaving and unweaving as the suitors pursued, as Ulysses was waiting for him to come home. I thought, I like this story. If I weave and I don't like it and I unweave or play with threads and threads, I don't lose what I've done. I take those same threads and reweave and rework them. So many of the tapestries that I've done and textiles, if it had been paintings, they'd be lost forever. The material and everything would have been gone. But in the textiles, so many of my things I, were, I was able to make, undo, unwind, unweave, unwrap and make another one. It was very concrete to me. It didn't seem, and also I'm from Nebraska, and I hate waste. So I could keep using my materials over and over again. I, it's a kind of inbred thing for me. It annoys my husband, I think, the way I reuse things. Um, Textiles are marvelous for that, when you unknit or unsew and reassemble or wrap. You see all the things I'm wrapping? That's my whole, clo I, my whole closet is when I can't use it, I wrap it and save it and make art out of it. Painting, I would just be painting the walls and then repainting the walls and then <laughs> You're a painter? I could tell. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Um, at the Barn Theater, uh, the Yale, Yale and Cedar Winston Academy in San Diego, there was one piece that contributed to these symbolic things about life. And I wonder if you remember, it was one, one thread that had always did everything. I don't think so. You caught it. You got it. I'm back in, uh, I'm back in Princeton today. My two brothers have died. 
younger brothers uh, went to Princeton. I was in my brother's wedding here at the Princeton Cathedral, and today I came back, and Mike took us for a walk around the campus, and I walked down the aisle, where I walked as a bridesmaid for my brother's wedding, and I'm back in Princeton like that weaving that began, wove a good long story, and is back where it began, the thread. So where is the warp, and where is the weft? It's all one. And if it all comes together in a balanced and harmonious way, it's a life. 